But Havlicek steals it. Havlicek stole the ball. Down goes Frazier. Down goes Frazier. Chris Fowler and welcome to Sports Century. He was the perfect quarterback at 6'4", 215 pounds. He had a gun for an arm, lightning reflexes, and the mindset of a winner. In his second season, he led Miami to the first of what promised to be many Super Bowl appearances. Before he retired 15 seasons later, Dan Marino compiled the best quarterback stats in NFL history, but never again would he reach pro football's ultimate prize. That Super Bowl question was always there. You know, the idea that you don't have a ring, you're going to go out without a ring. You only did a Super Bowl ring to find you to go through there. all you've done. That's enough, guys. Okay, thanks. All of this was compounded by uh, fans and media increasingly uh, asking him how he felt about it. Kind of like in shock after this one's hard to discuss things like that. You know, right now, just, you know, don't really know what to say other than we just got our butt kicked. That's the question that you always answer, no matter what, what kind of game or what kind of year you have. The year's not successful unless, you know, you win the Super Bowl. Every snap of the football is going to the quarterback. So, you know, we get paid the big money. We get probably, uh, you know, too much of the praise when we win and too much of the blame when we lose. After appearing in Super Bowl 19, Marino and the Dolphins failed to make the playoffs in six of the next nine seasons. He really became so focused on getting back to the Super Bowl and winning the Super Bowl. It became his obsession. He went to one Super Bowl, he told me in New Orleans. It was the only one he ever watched in person, and he had to leave at halftime because he felt sick to his stomach. That pressure was always there because he gave people hope. They were expected to perform much better than their talent necessarily you know, should have allowed them. As the years mounted unfulfilled, images of failure played in Marino's head. Most disturbing were four Super Bowl appearances by Buffalo and Jim Kelly, a quarterback selected in the same draft as Marino. When the Buffalo Bills were dominating the Miami Dolphins, and Marino was very, very frustrated, and I, and I went by him by his locker and asked him about it, and he would look up to me and said, look at their roster, look at the players that they have. He didn't enjoy the give and take with the media, and so once people would get on the question of, are you ever going to win a Super Bowl? He would just shut down. It became an increasingly difficult question for him to answer because he would always come out with, look, I could retire today and I'll still be a happy man uh, without a Super Bowl ring. But you knew it was eating at him. We're definitely a better team. We just need to find a way you know, to win more games in regular season so we have more of an advantage in the playoffs. Frustration was just built up. There were a lot of things that were written uh, about him that he didn't like. For a winner, which is what he was, to be perpetually asked questions about losing and being a loser, I, I mean, I'd be pretty bitter about it, too. As Marino threw for one NFL record after another, there was seldom an effective ball carrier to complement his passing game. For this, his head coach took most of the heat. Well, there's been a lot of comment about Don Tula being run-oriented. You had Larry Zonka and, and Jim Kick. What'd you do? You run the ball. Then you get a Dan Marino. What do you do? You throw the ball. With Dan, it became evident that he was such a great passer that you wanted to surround him with the best possible receivers and, and utilize the passing game to the utmost. He stands as the classic example in NFL history of why, if you put too much stock in your quarterback and you live and die with him, you're going to die a lot more than live. I remember practices when the Dolphins didn't run the ball hardly at all in practice. It was an hour and a half of Dan Marino throwing to his receivers. It became so much more difficult to just be one-dimensional. You had to have that ability to pound the ball, to control clock, and they didn't have it. 
I ain't lying. We used to laugh when we heard every single year, we're committed to the running game. They never had a running game. And we knew if it came down to it, it was going to come down to number 13. I think he wanted to throw the ball 40 times. Let's not kid. You know, I don't think that Dan was particularly longing for a running back. I don't think that the quarterback, Dan Marino, had great patience. And when you have his abilities, it's hard to have patience say, I, we're going to go ahead and run for two yards here so we can run it in the fourth quarter. I can pass for 10, 20 yards. In hindsight, perhaps they should have gone against the green and done that. But it was so hard to take the ball out of his hands. I guess you could be Bill Parcells' giants and keeping the ball for 40 minutes and, and wearing down a defense. And that's all very nice in theory. But I'll take the, the quarterback who's going to keep giving me very quick 64-yard strikes and, and 45 points a game. And if that's not enough to win, it's not my quarterback's fault. I'm going to go ahead and blame my defense on that. Anytime you score 45 points and lose a game, uh, there's some holes that need to be filled. By December 1999, time was running out. In week 12 of his 17th season, the usually calm, collected Dan Marino boiled over after losing on a late field goal to the Colts. These questions are ridiculous. I'll tell you how tough it is, is you work your butt off all week and then you lose a game like that, three points with two seconds left, that's how tough it is. You wouldn't know, would you? I mean, that's just the emotion of the game and, you know, I. I never apologize for that because uh, I think that's part of it. Their season ended up falling apart right after that game. He had had a great game, and it was a microcosm for his entire career. He had done all these wonderful things. They had come close. They had looked great, but not quite great enough. That was a frustration of a lot of years of, of not being a champion, and I think now realizing I'm not going to make it. When Dan Marino enrolled at the University of Pittsburgh in 1979, he wasted no time displaying the gifts that would mark his greatness. The first passing drills that we started, I watched them um, drop back, and you, you could see and you knew that this was the real deal. Coach Cheryl, who recruited me there, you know, told me that he wanted me to come in with the attitude that, that I'm going to be the starting guy right away. And, and I have to compete for it, obviously, but he felt like I could compete and, and win the job. Being a young guy, uh, stepping in as a freshman, uh, starting the game, he took charge of the field. Uh, the confidence that just surrounded him kind of, you know, overflowed on everybody else. From the first time I saw Dan Marino, was that just pop and it's gone 35 40 yards and back to throw it goes over the middle with it the pass is caught for the tight end brown touchdown pittsburgh he threw six in one game and the local tv cut it off to do something else the pit fans here in town were just absolutely incredulous a couple of guys showed up at the station and wanted to beat up the uh, the uh, security guard under Marino's cool command, the Panthers posted three consecutive 11-1 seasons. As a junior, he topped the NCAA by passing for 37 touchdowns and led Pitt into the Sugar Bowl. Down by three with 42 seconds left, Marino had the ball on the Georgia 33. In that instance, I mean, it was, it was fourth and five and it had been a long field goal, and I'm like, yeah, let's we'll go for it, fourth and five. Could be the last play for him. Marino goes deep. If it had been thrown any other style, any other way, the underneath guy would have tipped it away, or the guys coming over the top would have got there and destroyed the play. The next fall, Marino was a Heisman favorite, and Pitt was ranked number one in the preseason. Certainly, the community expected it after the, the Tony Dorsett era. Hey, you're going to lead us to the national championship. We haven't had one for four years now. You know, that kind of thing is very hard for anyone, let alone a 20 or 21-year-old man. His senior year, I think that there was so much pressure and so much expectations to do more. I think the whole team pressed a little bit. Amid rumors of cocaine use, Marino struggled on the field, throwing 23 interceptions and only 17 touchdowns. My feeling was that the whole team partied. There was probably some guilt by association. Danny's the big, strong, handsome leader of the team, therefore he must be involved in it. He came to me and, and, and 
you know, asked me what, you know, what my thoughts on the thing were, and I said, Danny, you're in a fishbowl. The people you hang around with, what other people are doing around you, that's going to always reflect on you. It's a shame this day and age that happens where there's, there's rumors like that, and, and I think it has to do with the focus of the team. You know, we had a chance to win a national championship the year before, and they felt like we were the favorites that year. It was hard for all of us because, um, because there was a great deal of love and a great deal of compassion for one another on that team, and he's the one who took the heat for it. The glare of that heat radiated from the local media, and Marino was fed up. He hated them in terms of, I want to get out of Pittsburgh. Well, maybe it's better if I get away and experience uh, another city on my own. Hi, hello, and welcome back to the New York Sheridan Hotel in New York City for the 1983 National Football League Collegiate Player Draft. Before the 83 draft, uh, we weren't thinking about a quarterback. We liked Marino. We had him rated right next to John Elway as far as the, uh, the two top quarterbacks coming out of the draft. But as the draft approached, the drug rumors persisted, deflating Marino's stock despite a strong defense by his coach. I do remember that he had a drug test taken to prove to Foge that he was clean. We called up five football teams, talked to the head coach, and explained to whole if they had any questions at all, that they could come and see it. Chuck Knoll later said that one reason they overlooked Danny was because of the rumors. The first choice in the draft, quarterback John Elway of Stanford. Todd Blackledge, Jim Kelly, Miami of Florida. Tony Eason, Jets take Ken O'Brien of California Davis. I was in his house the day he was drafted, uh, and one by one the quarterbacks went in front of him, and he became visibly sick when Ken O'Brien was too drafted. He went upstairs. He, he couldn't take it anymore. As the draft was going on, I was like, you know, what's wrong? Is there, you know, why wasn't I getting picked before some of these other guys? You know, when that enters your mind, it does. Well, the Dolphins, who never thought they were going to have a crack at this guy with the 27th pick of the first round, uh, at one point, Don Shula gets on the phone and calls Foch Fazio and, and asks him point blank, what's wrong with Dan Marino? He must have called once an hour until it got down to where he might be there. And, and uh, Shula says, we're going to take him. The Dolphins select quarterback Dan Marino of Pittsburgh. I don't know who is going to work with him down there. Uh, who is, where is the great quarterback coaching genius on the Dolphins? I know Arnst Parker is a great defensive coach. I don't see where he's going to get this great coaching that's going to overcome the problems he's had. I was uh, not a quarterback coach. I had Unitas, uh, Hall of Famer, and uh, had Bob Greasy was a Hall of Famer, and Earl Morrill's in my own personal Hall of Fame, and uh, Zimmerman didn't think I was a quarterback coach. Getting drafted late in the first round that made me work so much harder that offseason, I was, and I was ready for it. Those rumors did have an effect on him. They made him very guarded and wary, just about throughout his whole career. I remember Dan Reno's first practice because it was really unlike any other practice. Reno walked on the field and started throwing balls. The other players stopped mingling around, and Shula just stood there with his hands on his hips, staring at Marino. The first six weeks of the uh, 1983 season, the Dolphins' offense was struggling badly. Uh, David Woodley was at quarterback, and Don Shula looked at the situation and knew he had to make a change. Dan Marino's first start was against the Buffalo Bills, and it was a great game. Here's Marino running to his right, throws in the end zone, caught for a touchdown. I was watching on TV like everybody else, and just remember just being in total awe and saying, this guy looks like the greatest, greatest who's ever stepped on the field in terms of pure passing ability. When the game was over, and it was a bitter defeat for the Dolphins, Shula stood in his press conference, and he had this beaming look to him that nobody could ever remember him having after a loss before. It's hard for me to stomach a loss, but I knew that we had discovered something in that ball game that was going to be the quarterback of the future for the Miami Dolphins. Shula's discovery threw for 20 touchdowns and was the first rookie quarterback ever to start in a Pro Bowl. This was no surprise to the hometown folks back in Pittsburgh. You could tell right away that I had a knack for throwing a football or a baseball. I worked night turns, so I had time. I was free every day. When I'd come home from work, he'd be waiting on me. I'd get home usually some days at noon, other days at 2. 
and uh, we'd just go down the field and throw balls. When I used to walk around, if we'd walk to the park on the way, I'd just throw the ball, and if there was no one with me, I'd throw it at a telephone pole or a stop sign and go get it. Most grade school teams, like oh, fifth, sixth grade, seventh and eighth, you know, you're running the ball. We were throwing the ball, and we're not talking about maybe 10 yards, little loopy passes. I didn't know how hard it was until other people would throw to me and see how soft it was. At Central Catholic High School, Marino turned the eye of Major League Baseball scouts and college football coaches, but his competitive fire burned hottest on the gridiron. He was a, the fiercest competitor I've ever been around. He wanted to win at uh, relay races in gym class. The other kids responded to that, you know, and, and we never were out of a game. We always figured he could bring us back, and, and he did quite often. We knew when he was in high school that he had the potential to be special. But even his strongest hometown supporters could not foresee what Marino would do to NFL defenses in his first full season. By the 84 season, uh, Dan Marino wasn't a second-year player. He was like a 10th-year player. We were witnessing greatness at its very highest level. It was Michael Jordan making the last shot against Utah for an entire year. Some of the DBs, you say, well, we could have done it. I said, could have. If you could have done it, something or shut us down, then you all would have. They ran one particular route where the receivers would take off down the sideline, and before they would even break on the route, the ball was in the air, and it was almost an unstoppable route. You know, we'll blitz him, we'll rush him, you'd blitz him, he'd kill you. And so then you, you lay off him, and he'd stand back there and kill you that way. Marino, deep drop, throwing deep upfield down the near side, man open, touchdown! In that memorable 1984 season, Marino set records by passing for 48 touchdowns and more than 5,000 yards as the Dolphins stood at the doorstep to pro football's Valhalla. Not until we got to the Super Bowl, Super Bowl 19 against the 49ers, did Dan look mortal at all during that year. And then they went to the Super Bowl and, and lost that game because basically their, their two inside linebackers couldn't cover Roger Craig. The 49er defense stopped Dan Marino and the uh, Dolphin defense could not stop the 49ers. It happened so fast for us, I don't think we respected it as much as we should have at the time. And although we, I felt like we were going to win, when we didn't, I was like, well, maybe, you know, can we play this thing again tomorrow? Because uh, if we play tomorrow, I know we'll win this game. I broadcast that game and I remember thinking, well, they lost, but we're going to see this guy over and over. This is this kid's second year. I'm sure that we're going to go there a few more times and, may, and possibly win a few. Montana. Hey, Marino. Diet Pepsi, 100% Nutri-Sweet. Uh, here you go. Don't drop it. Joe, next year, I'm buying. Anybody who watched the game would have been shocked that night walking out of the stadium, you know, in California and, and just saying that this guy's never going to get to another Super Bowl. The saddest image of him is walking out of that Super Bowl with his tuxedo still in the dry cleaning bag, waiting for a party that would never come. Miami was a sleepy city in the 60s and the 70s. In the 80s, there were all these changes culturally, socially, demographically. And into this Miami Vice image comes this perfect quarterback for this time. You would walk in a mall, and if you didn't see half the kids wearing number 13 jerseys, something was wrong. Put on your isotonic gloves and let's go out and play. So you take care of the hands. Take care of you. There were no uh, Miami Heat or Florida Panthers or, or Florida Marlins. He carried sports in this town. He drew 75,000 people to the stadium simply because he was there. In his first eight seasons, Marino averaged 30 touchdowns and almost 4,000 yards in the air. Despite being criticized for his lack of mobility, he was the least sacked starter in the NFL. Gary Stevens, who used to be the offensive coordinator for the Dolphins' work with Marino for years, used to say that, that he had footwork like Fred Astaire. I think really it started from when I was a kid, I used to jump rope. I mean, I jumped rope all the time, and I think it helps with your footwork. He's not gonna get away from a lot of people. But the, the little evasive moves that he did in the pocket, 
Nobody's ever done that. Nobody ever escaped like he did with people all around him that close. With Marino, it didn't take long. He, you know, you, so as a defensive back, a lot of times you could be caught out of position because you're used to watching some guy with a real long release. I just was amazed at times where you think that he was caught and all of a sudden, boom, he'd snap that ball out there and there's Clayton or Duper pulling one in for six points. He drops quickly to throw, looks right across the middle. He's got Clayton open, 10, 5, touchdown Dolphins! The game that Dan Marino and the Dolphins played in 1985 on Monday night in the Orange Bowl against the 12-0 Chicago Bears was one of the greatest games in NFL history. Buddy Ryan had a had his Bear defense, his famous for now, and where where they just come after the quarterback and they play man coverage, and and you knew it was coming, and they they felt like they you know they could stop anybody. We just took them apart, and it was fun doing it, and you, we did it because we knew the talent of Marino, being able to get rid of the football in the face of a free blitzer. The offensive game that he played that day may be one of the great quarterback games ever played. In a 38-24 win, Marino riddled Buddy Ryan's 46 defense for 270 yards and three touchdowns. His swaggering confidence was as much a part of his image as his high-velocity arm. The day we were doing a photo shoot at the stadium um, and there was nobody there, I would asked Dan to throw passes to a friend of mine just to try to catch his quick release. And I could hear my buddy in the background kind of grimacing every time the ball hit him on the hands. Um, to the point where I had to ask Danny, could he kind of tone it down a little bit? And Dan looked right at me, and as serious as I've ever seen him, he just said, I throw one way. Dan Marino did not lack confidence, that's for sure. And I think it was a tremendous quality he had. Dan is my type of player. You know, he'll draw it up in the sand if he has to. You know, you know, he'll make it up on the sideline. You know, that's the type of guy he can win with. It's a commanding sense that he doesn't just uh, have a spot on the team. He owns that spot. And when he's in the huddle, it is his meeting room. You're a quarterback. You handle the ball in every play. And if, if you don't believe in yourself and what you're doing in the program, and, and uh, it's hard to sell it to everybody else. All right, let's go. Let's go. Play with some urgency now. A little urgency. It's not even courage what it is. It's, it's the Cayunes, you know, to throw the ball into that spot and not worry about the consequences. And he just dared defenses to, to stop him. Very first play that I went out there, Dan Marino, made a check, looked over at me, smiled, and I looked at him just looking nervous. I was just so scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. Threw the ball, and I intercepted the ball and ran it back for a touchdown. Usually, a quarterback a shy away from a guy, you know, after they didn't return a touchdown on him. Dan Marino came right back, threw just about eight passes in a row, and ended up coming back and winning the football game in the end. Marino's stare had different degrees to it. Uh, there was a, a let's get ready for the game guys stare, which was a pretty imposing stare. But then there was a it's time to do something stare, and that stare overshadowed the let's get ready to play stare. When I first came in, it was scary. You know what I mean? You don't want to disappoint Dan Marino. You can't stare as hard as him, but you want to stare back a little bit, let him know that, you know, I know you're Dan Marino, but please give me a break. <laughs> I saw it so many times when, when somebody messed up, he made sure that uh, they knew it. He never shied away from you know, getting in somebody's face. It's part of the position that you play, and, and it's not necessarily getting in someone's face. I mean, I always wore my emotions, you know, right there on my sleeve, and I was very, you know, outspoken about it on the field. I've seen him jump up, run up to the offensive lineman that was in front of me, point at him and point at me, you know, like, you know, damn, if you can't block him, I'll block him times he would chew us out and uh, but it was only it wasn't nothing personal it was just it was the competitor he was and once you understood that then you know you didn't have a problem with it it was successful for Danny it worked for Danny and, and those guys usually didn't make the same mistake twice limiting his fiery nature to the field and locker room Marino's cool off-field demeanor can be traced back to his city roots there's a saying that you're a Pittsburgh guy, and for those who don't understand, it means you're a regular, down-to-earth person. You never forgot where you came from. You never forgot your roots. Well, Dan is a Pittsburgh guy. He doesn't forget people. I remember one night after a Dolphins-Pittsburgh Steeler game, I'm just, you know, heading across the parking lot with my little wheelie bag, and uh, all of a sudden, this blazer comes up. 
you know, honk, honk. And I, you know, I gave him the, that startled look like, and it was a typical Pittsburgh guy move, you know, and he's going like that. The bigger sometimes people get, the more distant they become. And I think Danny has always kept his feet firmly planted on the ground. He has a very warm and engaging personality, so he, he was always very popular inside the locker room. And that's hard for a superstar to be. He was really the kind of guy that you would feel comfortable with uh, talking about anything, to just kind of hang out. Some of you'd meet maybe down at the corner bar when you went up to, you know, went up to just relax for a Saturday night. Although he threw the ball like Joe Namath, he didn't have that Joe Namath persona. He wasn't the type of person uh, that was partying late at night. Married in 1985, Dan and Claire have five children. During the off-season, Marino often combines social time with his teammates and his children. He invites us to his home a lot, and you know, around his family, and his kids are just wonderful. We sit back and just were just, just amazed at what, what type of father that he really is. He's always great with kids, and uh, you know, people, I don't know that people have a true impression of what Dan's like all the time. One particular day out at training camp, there was a, a, a little blind boy who had a seeing eye dog with him, and Dan had come off the field after a long practice. He sat down with the boy and gave him all the time in the world. You wouldn't believe how many people come down as uh, part of the Make-A-Wish Foundation and other things where that's the child's you know, last dying wish is to go to a Dolphins game and meet Dan Marino. It's so genuine, so real, so heartfelt. So many times he's walked away from the kids in tears, not wanting the dying child to see his tears. There were times where it really affected him, you know, because, you know, the people would write back and say that, my son passed away last week, you made his life, and that's all he ever wanted to do is meet you, that type of stuff. And that's kind of hard to take, you know, for a guy who himself has five children. In 1990, Dan and Claire learned that Michael, their two-year-old son, was autistic. Did it change me? No, it probably made me concentrate a little more on how, how can I help and what can I do extra to make a difference. He attacked it personally, saying, what do I need to do to help my son? That's Dan, the family person. He also attacked it from a standpoint of understanding what he can do for the community. And that was really the impetus behind the Dan Marino Foundation. Raising millions of dollars, Marino helped to build a leading children's hospital in South Florida. He was named the NFL's Man of the Year in 1998. Anytime you went down to do something to help somebody else, you pick up the phone, you get him. And you don't go through agents, you don't say, what's the price on it? If it's worthwhile, you'll do it. And uh, there are not that many of them around today. He did things with that power in this community to make this community better that was moving in ways that transcend sports. The thing about Dan Marino is when you first see him, you're like shocked that this guy's not a linebacker, that he was a quarterback. And you just had no idea that quarterbacks can be that big, that thick, that strong. Dan was a, is, the, is the toughest football player I've ever been around. He was able to deal with pain better than any athlete I've ever been with. He's been hurt a number of times. Uh, he wears every single pad that's available. If they invented a new pad, Dan Marino had it on. You have to see him after a game to appreciate his toughness. He peels off his uniform and he looks like Boris Karloff in The Mummy. There would still be a lot of times he'd release the ball and get killed, and I would see him in the training room on Wednesday or Thursday, barely able to walk. We were playing the Indianapolis Colts in the second quarter. He, he was hit in the knee, comes to the sidelines, and tells me he's torn his meniscus in his knee. I said, well, come on over. You got to sit down. We got to take a look at this. He goes, no, no, I'm fine because I know what's happened. I've torn the meniscus in my knee. I'm fine, I'm gonna continue to play. He had a, a longevity record here for seven or eight years without missing a game. You know, for a quarterback in football in this modern era to go that long, uh, you thought he was invincible. Despite chronic knee problems, Marino lived by the phrase, always on Sunday, starting 145 straight games from 1984 to 1993. Then came the second quarter, on October 10th. We're playing Cleveland and, you know, went back to pass like he's done a thousand times in his career and all of a sudden the leg gave out and he was on the ground and when he didn't get up, I knew that it had to be something serious because Marino always gets up. I threw the pass and I fell down, I turned around, there's no one back there and I'm like, oh, something happened, there goes the Achilles. I knelt down, I could feel his Achilles tendon, he had no strength pushing against it and you could feel the rupture in his Achilles. 
No matter what the circumstances are with this injury, I will be back and I will play football again. I thought that I'd be able to play again, but am I going to be able to play at the same level? Can I adjust to it if I can't? So all those things go through your head for sure. And it did that whole offseason for me. After a long, arduous rehab, Marino kept his word, returning to action in 1994. When he came back, he came back very strong. And if you look at that opener of the 94 season, it's one of the greatest games I think he ever played. I throw five touchdowns in that game, and I throw one at the end on a fourth down situation. Marino out of the gun, and he's been deadly again. Touchdown, Irving Price. Big touchdown pass the day for Dan Marino. Against the Jets in November, Marino rallied the Dolphins, cutting an 18-point deficit to three. Then, after advancing inside the Jets' 10 with less than 30 seconds left in the game, Marino sucker punched New York. Well, you're getting down close, so I think you're going to spike the ball and just take the timeout. But, uh, you know, we had a play where the receivers would run short routes and try and, you know, beat the corners off and make it look like a clock play. And they've been practicing this, you know, f for the right moment. And these are things that only guys who have experience in the league can really try and pull off. Dan had everyone come to the line of scrimmage and he didn't have his normal bounce. He calmed himself down, and he lulled everybody to sleep, and then he beat him with his arm. Marino takes the snap from center. He's looking. He throws. Oh, yeah. Touchdown, Dolphins! Mark Ingram! Unbelievable! And the best feeling was, uh, you know, looking around after we did that and seeing 72,000 Jet fans just dead quiet. He played, and he played well at times, but he never came back to where his leg didn't even look normal. It was uh, love of the game, whatever you say. Uh, the years he came back after that, it's amazing how effective he was. In 1995, Marino broke Fran Tarkenton's career records for most attempts, completions, touchdowns, and yards. It took Marino less than 13 seasons to do what Tarkenton accomplished in 18. To break Fran Tarkenton's records, to uh, uh, do some of them at home. Dan Marino has now thrown for more yards than anyone else. Touchdown record I broke in Indianapolis and, and um, thrown at the Keith Byers. More touchdowns than any other man in National Football League history. They're devastating. I think all quarterbacks look at them and are devastated. Playing for 15 years myself, I just judge it that way. I'm, I, it just knocks me out. In 1996, after yet another early playoff exit, the Dolphins' future seemed to brighten when two-time Super Bowl champion Jimmy Johnson returned to the sidelines and replaced Don Shula. There was unbelievable expectation. Uh, Dan Reno thought that Jimmy Johnson would be his ticket to the Super Bowl. The attitude you have to look at as a player is, you know, anybody that's going to give you a chance to, to, to win a championship, which everybody believed that Jimmy would do that, and, and I'm no different. The only thing he was interested in was winning a Super Bowl, and he, really, that's why he embraced Jimmy Johnson. So when Jimmy Johnson said, Dan, we're going to run the football more, I think Dan Reno said, fine, let's, let's try it your way. We've tried it my way, and it hasn't worked. When you take Dan's fiery personality, you know, add that into the mix, if Jimmy's plan didn't work, that it was going to be tough. Here's a guy that, if it's third and three, he wants to throw the ball. Jimmy didn't draft well for the running game. You know, he did build, build a good defense, but it wasn't a suffocating, dominant defense. The whole game plan still fell back on Marino's shoulders. A sputtering offense led to three mediocre seasons and two early playoff exits. After clashing with Marino over offensive philosophy, in January 1999, a frustrated Johnson said he was retiring. But within 24 hours, he ran a reverse. Jimmy Johnson, citing personal reasons, was all but resigned as coach of the Miami Dolphins. However, after an early morning change of heart aided by the addition to the staff of old friend Dave Wanstatt, Johnson decided to stay on after all for now. He would pretty much realized he had to change the offense. He had to fire the, fire the offensive coordinator in Gary Stevens. And he had to force some things down Dan Marino's throat and strip Dan Marino of the ability to audibleize. He was excellent at doing that throughout his career. And uh, taking that away was, uh, you know, to him was kind of uh, demeaning to his ability. Jimmy simplifies everything. And he simplifies everything because he realizes that maybe the other 44 or 45 guys in the team aren't nearly as smart as Dan Marino is. So who suffers from that simplification but Dan Marino? 
I just felt that Dan had a confidence about him that he knew the offense better than anyone else and that he was as qualified as anyone else uh, to figure out what play needed to be called at what time. I was a former quarterback watching the Miami Dolphins play. It felt like I was looking at a quarterback with a hand tied behind his back. Jimmy and Aikman uh, had their differences too early on before they became close. And maybe if Dan was a younger quarterback, uh, it wouldn't have been such a significant thing. The 99 season began auspiciously with a 38-21 win over defending Super Bowl champion Denver. The Dolphins were 3-1 and one when Marino went down with a neck injury, missing five games. When he returned, he wasn't the same player. <sighs> I think the interceptions that Marino threw, for the most part, were the result of his body deteriorating. I think he was still competitive enough and arrogant enough about his own abilities that he didn't recognize his skills had diminished. Marino's struggle to get back to his former playing self frayed his already strained relationship with his coach. Our football team needs some changes, you know, and Right now, we need to take a little bit of time to pull back away from this before I can decide what we're going to do. I have no idea what we're going to do right now. When Johnson lost faith in Marino, uh, Marino's attitude changed drastically. And you can see the frustration and resentment building on both sides. Blame it on whoever you want to blame it on, but we're just not playing good enough to win. And, uh, you know, it, it's, it's real, it's tough to take. Jimmy Johnson was truthful in a lot of things he said. Dan did struggle in those games he talked about. But everybody knew that. It doesn't really have to be brought to anybody's attention. Every morning you wake up, you drive to work, you turn the news on, and it's, you know, it's Jim and Danny. After a while, it, it was inevitable that it became a distraction. Before his last year, they had, a, they had a huge disagreement over the status of his contract. Jimmy wanted more concessions from Dan. Dan was willing to help them out, but Dan wasn't willing to slash and burn his contract down to uh, where he's the 27th highest paid quarterback either. Jimmy's always been a professional mercenary, you know, comes in and just does these things with cold-hearted precision. And Dan Marino isn't someone who's treated with cold-hearted precision, not here, not ever. Jimmy was really frustrated by the fact that Marino was the only player he ever encountered his whole career whose aura was stronger than Jimmy's himself, and that prevented Jimmy from benching Dan. With Marino, the Dolphins limped to a 9-7 and seven season. After getting by Seattle in the wild card game, Miami suffered the second worst playoff loss in NFL history, 62-7 to Jacksonville. And I can't begin to even fathom what Dan must have been thinking about. Nobody could have ever imagined that Dan Marino would fail so miserably. Deep left side, intercepted by Beasley. By the time he got his first completion, it was the second quarter, and his career really was over at that point. Marino threw two interceptions and totaled just 95 yards passing. It takes a lot out of a team when there's obvious friction between the head coach and your best player. They got absolutely slaughtered in the game. Probably one of the worst games he's ever played in his entire life. And immediately the speculation begins, is this or is this not Dan Marino's last game? It was either the coach or the quarterback. One had to go because Jimmy Johnson and Dan Marino could no longer coexist for another season. Less than 24 hours after the most embarrassing defeat in franchise history, Johnson called it a career. Following Johnson's exit, it soon became clear that Marino was not in new head coach Dave Wanstead's plans. For the man who had thrown 420 career touchdown passes, the unimaginable suddenly became very real. I thought that this is a guy who loved it so much that he would have a very difficult time saying no. And when the Minnesota opportunity came up, I thought he might take it. Dan Marino did not want to retire. Just imagine uh, you being on your job, you loving it all your life, and then at the age of 38, somebody says, well, it's time for you to quit. Yes or no really comes down to do you feel like you can play or not. And my instincts as a football player when Minnesota wanted me to come play, and there were some other teams too, was, hey, I can go play. I went over. 
spoke with him and Claire, and he was, you know, talking about the Minnesota thing. At some point, it becomes more important than winning, fo winning football games or Super Bowls or whatever. I mean, you have your whole life to live. Ultimately, Marino decided to retire after 17 seasons as a Miami Dolphin. I was able to play 17 years for the Miami Dolphins. And uh, I'm going to miss it. I'm going to miss everything about it. Probably what hurt Dan and drove Dan the most down the latter stages of his career was John Elway not only winning two straight Super Bowls, but winning his last one in a Super Bowl MVP right there in Joe Robbie Stadium where Dan Marino played football. It was a great feeling to watch him, you know, after all those years, have a chance to win. John's a friend, and, and, uh, uh, and then, but then some ways, you know, I was a little jealous because I wish it would have been me. Elway may be more highly regarded simply because he won a couple Super Bowls late in his career, and Dan failed to ever get the Dolphins back after his second season. If statistics alone were the measure, Marino would rank among the highest of Hall of Famers. Because they aren't, his status in history is unclear. You're going to get to a point that Terry Bradshaw has four Super Bowl rings and Joe Montana, you know, Dan Marino, where's he fit in? Well, he didn't win a Super Bowl. Whether it's fair or not, and whether he had good enough teams around him to win Super Bowls or get to Super Bowls uh, isn't what will linger. It will always be the black mark on an otherwise bright career. There was a time where we just did nothing but worship our sports heroes, and that would have been enough. But now, if you don't have a ring, you can't be considered the greatest ever. It just doesn't work that way. Here is Marino back to throw. He's going deep. Got a man down there. He's got a touchdown! Oh, ho, ho. I would equate stupidity to anyone who says the fact that he didn't win a Super Bowl has tarnished his record. When you figure that Dan Marino threw for over 60,000 yards, which makes it about 35, 36 miles, that means he could lead a drive from downtown Miami, past Fort Lauderdale, up to Palm Beach. People who played with him and the people who played against him believed that Dan could accomplish anything on the field, that he could win on the strength of his will and his right arm. And there's only a handful of people who have ever played any sport who can say that. Marino was the greatest sports warrior I have ever known. It was like uh, God said to him, son, I'm going to put you down on the earth for one reason, to play football. Late in his career, Marino was a shadow of the quarterback who once threw 48 touchdown passes in a season. He held on betting on the promise of one last shot at a Super Bowl ring, but it never came. When he retired, he said, I'm not going to have that chance, but it doesn't take away from what I've done personally. Certainly nothing can change the fact that Marino owns every important career passing record in the NFL, but the lack of a Super Bowl victory renders his legacy one stat short of perfection. For Sports Century, I'm Chris Fowler.